صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله وآله الأرحام على رسول الله وآله الأرحام
Sent Brother Muhammad Ais, Alhamdulillah, really powerful recitation of Al Quran Al Majid. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you eternally, inshaAllah. It's a pleasure to be here again, brothers and sisters. May the peace and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you on this occasion. Inshallah, tonight, of course, we discuss jihad and nafs. And when we think about jihad, the word, it often invokes the most heinous stereotypes, especially amongst the media circles and society in the West. Insha'Allah ta'ala tonight we'll be exploring jihad in its purest sense to the best of our ability and try to combat these fake narratives as best we can insha'Allah. To begin, I would like to invite Brother Muhammad Sadiq to deliver his presentation on this subject. Please welcome him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I begin in the name of Allah, the most compassionate, the most merciful, the creator of the heavens and the earth. As Brother Hussein rightly pointed out, the word jihad is a scary word to say, particularly in public. Um, it's, it's a big term that's been coined in the media, and it's often betrayed in contrast or juxtaposition to a crusade. Um, so often, you know, allusions to uh, Salah al-Din, Saladin in English, you know, King John and King Richard, that's, that's the contrast, that's the dichotomy that's often portrayed. But in the uh, traditional Islamic understanding, jihad has a completely different spin. It's not negative at all. Uh, in fact, it's quite, it's looked upon with a lot of honor. Um, and it, to such an extent that it's actually a fairly common name in, in places with Muslim majorities, right? So you could have someone with the name jihad. So it'd be very, um, strange to find someone in, in Australia with the name Crusade, for example, but we do find examples of people being called Jihad. So it begs the question, what is Jihad and why is it so sacred to our tradition? Um, and, and when I speak of tradition here, I'm not only speaking about um, a particular culture, but I'm talking about Islam in general, through all sects of Islam, all schools of thought. So um, let's, let's start off with analysing what Jihad is, right? So j jihad really can be um, boiled down to this idea of a struggle. Now, it's funny because we get the word ijtihad, which is often associated with you know, uh, the sharia and rulings. Ijtihad is that struggle that we have to search for for meaning, for the, for, for the sharia, for the way that leads to Allah, right? Um, so that's the first notion of jihad. Now, jihad uh, is also broken up into two parts. Uh, according to the hadith of Rasulullah. The first part is the greater jihad and the lesser jihad. So the greater struggle and the lesser struggle. So the lesser struggle is the external struggle. And that means struggling against oppression. Now that can be in the form of Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahi anil Munkar. So um, condemning what is evil and uh, sort of, uh, not conforming, but uh, condoning what is good. Condoning is the word I'm looking for. Um, so, so that's the first aspect of it, and, and that translates into different things. So historically, that could mean if you have an invader coming, that you defend yourself. So Islam is pacifist to the degree that your own rights, your fundamental rights, for example, the right to life, is then trampled on, right? So that's the first aspect of jihad. Um, interesting, along with that aspect of jihad, it's not limited to circumstances of war, but an external jihad could also be, for example, there's, a, there's an example of Nana Asma'u, she was a princess or a queen um, from the Sokoto Caliphate, which is a West African Caliphate. So they're based in Nigeria. And interestingly, she ran a campaign on, on a jihad, and it was essentially a jihad against ignorance. 
And what that translated to was a campaign throughout the whole of Western Africa, um, or her region more particularly, um, against illiteracy. And she, would, uh, she, she brought 70 women, she educated each of the women, made them literate, um, made them navigate the Sharia, and each of those women went into a village and educated the people there. And it was fundamental to the spread of Islam in West Africa, or certain portions of West Africa. So we can see that the external jihad isn't necessarily limited to the idea of war. It could be expanded even further, for example, in, in the modern space uh, of conservation, of culture, um, of religion, of the climate and our environment. So jihad has multiple levels. That's on the external level. But the talk for today is primarily focused on the notion of the greater jihad, and that's jihad the nafs, right? Or, um, the jihad against the self. So we're going to talk about that for a bit. Um, now, the jihad against the self is quite a juicy topic in Islam in general. So across the two major schools of thought, being the, the Sunni and the Shia, there, there are two um, instrumental figures in our common perception of what the greater jihad is. The first one is Abu Hamd al-Ghazali from the Sunni school of thought. And in the Shia school of thought, it's pretty much a, a carbon copy of that but with the ahadith from the Ahl al-Bayt, and that is Faisal al-Kashani. Um, and it, it, it's very interesting because to understand the jihad against the self, you have to understand what the self is. Right? Like Sun Tzu says in The Art of War, you need to know your enemy before you engage your enemy, otherwise you're prepared for failure. So the question is, what is the self, or what are the different parts of the self? Um, and the first understanding, well, the self is divided into different parts, right? So what I say, who am I? I have different components. So you have the ruh, you have the nafs, and so on and so forth. But within the nafs, there are different aspects. So the first aspect is uh, nafs al-amara. So nafs al-amara is basically your carnal desire. Um, and we will get to a moral judgment of it from the Islamic perspective. But the carnal desire basically is your desire to survive, your animalistic instinct. And we all have it, and it's a beautiful thing. So, for example, um, if I have a desire to eat, that comes from a carnal desire. And it's a good desire because if I didn't eat, I would starve myself to death, right? Um, there's the desire, for example, lust. Lust is part of the nafs al-amara. Uh, al um, but if we didn't have lust within us, then we wouldn't procreate. We wouldn't reproduce and sustain the species. Um, we have uh, a, a... Sometimes we have greed, right? Now, greed in of itself isn't a bad thing, provided it's in a good environment. It's channeled in the right way. So it brings me to a thought. So this nafs al-ammara, this carnal desire, which often drives us to sin, be it, for example, backbiting, um, be it the, the condemnation and, and the judgment, the moral high horses, even part of that, arrogance. Um, and then obviously you have your explicit sins, such as you know, those of a sexual nature and whatnot. Um, the question is, all right, this nafs al-ammara, why has God given it to us? I mean, what's the point? Hasn't he sort of set us up for failure? That seems a bit unfair. I imagine you have a, a teacher who, who sort of prepares the exam questions in a way that you're going to fail. But I would say that's the wrong way to look at it. So the example I want to give here is, is martial arts. Um, so in, in traditional martial arts, particularly from China, there's a division, there's a category. The first form is Wushu, and the second one is Neija. So Wushu would have... Um, or schools, for example, that uh, are strike weapons, right? So you think of your traditional kung fu's, your karate's, your, your muay thai, that would fall under the category of wushu, so you hit, you hit, you hit. The other form of martial art is neija, uh, which means the transfer of energy. So things like aikido, things like jujitsu, um, things like judo, these are all neija. It's redirecting energy. And when it comes to the nafs, it's quite interesting that I think we have to take this twofold approach. Um, there's an epidemic in, in our country at the moment, particularly of, of, of young women and, and young men for that matter, of, of this idea of um, self-image, right? So for example, a girl might look at herself in a mirror and say, I'm not beautiful, or a guy might go to school, take off his shirt, you know, in the change room and be like, oh, you know, I wish I was buff, I wish I was built. Um, and, and you sort of blame yourself if they don't go beyond that. And sometimes that leads to self-harm leads to um, wrong actions or wrong decisions being made. Um, so the question is, all right, so you have this negative thought, but what do you do with this negative thought, right? Um, so Jesus, or Nabi Isa, as he's known in Islam, is quite an interesting figure. He gave one approach to uh, things that cause you to sin, right, or inadequacies within, within action. 
Jesus says that if your right hand causes you to sin, then cut it off. And if your eye causes you to sin, then pluck it out. Now, <laughs> we don't see people out on the street plucking out their eyes every time they do something wrong. And if, if, if we cut off our hands, I mean, we, we would have no hands left, right? We couldn't have this studio set up without a pair of hands. And I'm sure we're all sinners and we're all guilty with our hands in some way. But the interesting thing is that Nebuchadnezzar's providing approach of wushu, which is confronting the issue head on. So, for example, um, it may be that if you're in circles that cause you to do backbiting or circles that have a negative influence upon yourself, perhaps the wushu approach would be to distance yourself from those people. It doesn't mean go and hit those people, no. Rather, you distance yourself. Remember, the nafs is confined to the self. So action isn't taken upon other people. That's the external jihad. For the internal jihad, it's internalized. So action must be taken from within. So the blame, the malama, as it's known in Arabic, doesn't fall on the other, but rather on the self. The next form is, for example, naja. And how do we apply the principles of tai chi or naja, soft martial arts when it comes to nafs? The reason or the rationale that I, I would take is, is for example, with, with anger. Right? A lot of us, we have a lot of anger within us. And anger is a beautiful thing because anger used well leads to courage. And if we didn't have courage, we wouldn't have people out in the workforce daring, being dashing, making reforms. This all requires courage. And, and more so to that, it's channeled by the same source from which anger comes from, right? So the question now is anger. How do we confront our inner anger? And I would say a suggestion towards that would be the Tai Chi approach, which means not to cut yourself from anger, but to use it in the right place. So for example, um, anger used in the home setting. For example, you might have um, siblings who are quite annoying. We all have them. We have that annoying uncle. Sometimes our, our mother nags to clean our room or whatever, and, and, and you just lose it. But that's not the place to lose it. So the, the opposite of anger there should be used, which, which would be patience, right? But that's not to suppress anger entirely or aggression. For example, in a sport, aggression is perfect makes you involved in the game. It gets you, gets you on, it gets you into the zone, you know? At work, channeling that aggression into work is a beautiful thing. We couldn't accomplish half of what we do if it weren't for certain aspects of aggression. So there we see the approach of not blocking something entirely, but channeling it. And the same goes for lust. For example, we are not monks as Muslims, we are not nuns. Sorry. Um, oh, pun. <laughs> it's upstairs, maybe. Um, yeah, so when it, when it comes to lust, for example, we're not monks as Muslims. We don't deny ourselves of sex. In fact, Allah praises relationships. It brings mawadda and rahma. It brings affection and mercy. It also, it also brings, the Quran says, um, sakina, a form of tranquility. So it's something that's fundamental to the human experience. Allah doesn't tell you to cut yourself off from carnal desires in that manner. He says, no, rather, redirect it in a manner that will be fruitful for you, right? And he says, for example, in the context of marriage, which is a beautiful institution that needs to be preserved because it's fundamental to the human condition. Now, why is it fruitful? I mean, why, why, why this aspect of fruitfulness, right? In the Adhan, in the Iqama that we say all the time, we say, hayya alal falah, which is interesting. Sometimes it's translated as success, but falah in Arabic, literally a falah is a farmer. It's someone who sows seeds into the ground, right? So when you redirect aspects of the nafs, the negative aspects, into positive ground, when, when you redirect old seeds into fertile land, that is falah. That is reaping your rewards. So um, that's the, uh, the approach that I would take to the nafs. Look, I, I'm guilty, as I'm sure all of us are in one way or another. Um, but this is a journey that we all have to go through. And the other aspect of it, which is um, perhaps a little bit more niche, is that um, the jihad and nafs is extremely important to keep at the back of our mind because it gives us purpose. If we go back to the creation story in sort of the Bakr, right, there's this play. Allah sort of, if you can imagine this stage here, right, you, you have a play. And in the play, you've got Iblis and you've got the angel and uh, you've got this new prototype, Adam, right? Literally, Adam, he who's made from, from dam, which is blood, right? If you go back to the Hebrew. And then you've got Allah sort of in the background, right? 
in this divine play, this divine comedy or tragedy, whichever way you look at it, there's something really interesting. Allah commands all of creation to bow down before Adam. Really interesting here. The question is, what makes Adam different from all other creation? Ultimately, the only thing that Adam has, well, let, let's look at the others first, right? The first player is the angels, right? The angels, they're created of light, according to certain hadith, um, and they don't have choice. They don't have, they have reason, but they don't have choice, right? On the other hand, we have animals. Animals are complete instinct. They don't have the ability to reason or to rise above their occasion. Then you've got the jinn, which are a species that preceded us. And then you have the imps, insan, humanity. And humanity is bowed down before, or the whole of creation bows down before humanity. And we have the whole catastrophe that happens. But really, what does it come down to? So it goes to the next bit, which is the garden. The garden of Eden. The garden of Eden is beautiful. Because now we get to see, all right, this little prototype called human being, what are they doing? And the first thing they do is they question, so they have the ability to reason. The second thing is they're hungry, <laughs> so they have that animalistic instinct. And then the third thing is they make a choice. Despite being told not to eat of the fruit, they eat of the fruit. Which is really interesting because they're not bound by their instinct. They have the ability to rationalize about something that was being said. And they couple the two together, they marry it. And what they have to do is sort of fight with this inner battle, this jihad within them, eat the fruit or don't eat the fruit. It's kind of like to be or not to be, right? Shakespeare hit the nail on the head there. So, and eventually they eat of the fruit. And in Surat al um, Watini wa Zaytun, Surat al Teen, there's another interesting thing that Allah, Allah gives us a clue. He says, وَخَلَقَ الْإِنسَانُ أَحْسَنُ تَكُونُ ثُمَّ رَضَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافَنُونَ That we raise man the highest of the high, and we lowered him down to the lowest of the low, which shows the potentiality of the human condition. But potential can only exist, or good and evil for that matter, can only exist with the ability to choose between them. If there was only light, would, so if there was only light, then there would be no shadows. And so therefore evil is a byproduct of good in a way, but it's a necessary byproduct that allows good to be recognized. The same relationship exists between hot and cold. And so this inner jihad is a, a, it is the mechanism by which we find purpose. If we didn't have this inner jihad, this inner struggle, I mean, what's the point? If, if it was always, you know, um, sunlight, we would never appreciate the sunlight. But the night comes so we can appreciate the day. So that's why, you know, it, it, it's the hard moments that allow us to appreciate ease that comes, but also it's the struggle that allows us to reach the highest heights. And that's why Allah favors us. Because it is through choice and it is through that struggle that we gain proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think I'll end on that note because I could talk about this forever. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Jazakallah khair, brother Muhammad. It's really difficult to follow up something that amazing. Alhamdulillah. Um, just the allusion to to um, farming, for example, you mentioned Hayya al falah, and I recall that word. You know, when when we think of a farm, you're constantly um, you have to landscape, you have to plant, you have to take out, you have to reap, you have to sow. So it's when you're coming towards salat, you're basically coming there as a new person. The, as you say. Takbiratul Ihram, you're throwing all of this world behind you, essentially reinventing yourself. Every salat, just like just like a farm. You reap, you sow, you reinvent, and you're harvesting those uh, benefits time after time. So alhamdulillah. That that was I'd never thought of it that way, but subhanAllah, that was amazing. And just the importance of recognizing the balance between the spiritual and material, recognizing that we have to find a point where we don't over exceed in our materiality but at the same time we don't deny ourselves what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible we don't limit ourselves and as a result you know we live in a kind of aesthetic lifestyle you know so it's a sorry a kind of monastic lifestyle basically denying ourselves any kind of um, 
kind of materiality which Allah has made permissible so alhamdulillah and last thing of course Bob, who was who was that person the West African one Nana Asma'u, that was amazing, jihad against illiteracy, you know, subhanAllah. If, you rein, if we keep having programs like this on jihad, you know, you can reinvent jihad. Jihad, it doesn't have to mean what they try and portray, you know, inshallah, we can put these examples front and center and try to reinvent this word altogether. So, alhamdulillah, amazing, uh, amazing speech, brother, Allah bless you. And inshallah ta'ala with that, I'd like to move on to the next speaker for tonight's tonight's subject, Brother Muhammad Bais Hassan. Please welcome him with the Lord Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sada ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى الطيبين الطاهرين قال الله الحكيم في محكم الكتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم respected scholars my dear panel members friends brothers السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Why does God punish me? I'm sure this is a question that each and every single one of us has asked once in our life. Why does God or the universe, whatever we believe in, make it difficult for me to live on this earth? You know, with the trials, with the tribulations. Regardless of the situation, the first thing that a person, you know, when they go through these hardships and trials, they question, why is it that they are being targeted? Why is it that they've been targeted and no one else? Why do they have to go through that suffering, through that breakup, through that tragedy, through that death, and not other people out there? And first things first, because each and every single one of us essentially have one form of questioning about you know, our surroundings, I as you know, a fellow human being on this earth want you to know that you're not alone. If you experience this and if you feel like this, you are definitely not alone. People, you know, your fellow human beings on this earth are there to support you, are there to be with you, are there to help you in the best capability they can. And with that in mind, knowing that other people there are there to support you, to help you, comfort you and guide you, firstly shows that on this earth, mercy exists. You know, for starters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes Himself in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful. Chapter 55 of the Holy Quran constantly refers to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the merciful, ar-Rahman. So when we have a Lord who is there to, you know, show mercy and love and affection towards us, why is it that we feel that we're being suffering or that we're being tortured? And I think a good way to, you know, look at this matter is to see your surroundings. It's hard to be poor. But it's also hard to be rich. If you're poor, for example, or if you're afflicted with, afflicted with poverty, you're going to have to find a way to make ends meet. You have to do what you can to support your family, to support yourself, housing, food, water, electricity, what it may be. But if you're rich, you know, for example, if you're a multi-millionaire or billionaire, then you're going to have to find ways to properly invest your money, to properly utilize your money, your funds, how you're going to pay people, how you're going to direct, you know, what you own on a you know, uh, monetary basis, are you going to buy property, buy land, buy crypto, you know, whatever it could be, it's difficult, it's a head scratcher. So if you look at the paradigm, and we're just speaking about money, you find that it's, it, if you interpret the management of finances as difficult, you can also interpret the management of finances as a chore or as a struggle. And that's what the focus of our talk is here tonight, jihad. You had of the nafs, the struggle of the soul. It is difficult to manage your wealth, just like it's difficult to manage your health, just like it's difficult to manage your relationship, your faith, your spirituality. And if you look at every religion in the world, there is this notion that we have to do 
or the, the religion that you subscribe to really focus on striving and struggling. Striving and struggling towards something better. For example, Taoism or the Taoist faith. It's, it's all about cultivating, cultivating your soul in order to achieve a new level of enlightenment. A Christianity, our Christian brothers and sisters, what is the fundamental concept of Christianity? It is to carry the cross. And it's not just referring to the cross that our, our Christian brothers and sisters very well aware, but it's to carry the legacy of Jesus, what he represented and how you can uphold the true Christian values. Likewise, us in Islam, we have this exact same notion, and that is going through with the teachings of the Holy Prophet and his family. What did the Holy Prophet say before, before, he, before he passed away? He said, I leave behind for you two weighty things, the Quran and my Ahlul Bayt. Hold on to both of them. You'll never go astray. The Quran and Ahlul Bayt will never be divided up until the pool of Kalfa, until the very end, until the final day. So, there is this notion of struggling, struggling to become a better human being. How can we apply this in our practical life? And I'm just going to explain one example. It's not faith, it's not spirituality, it's not even money. It is something that we all achieve to have anywhere in this world, anywhere that you live, and that is true health. To have good health, to focus on your health. Because really, if you want to live a long life, if you want to be with your family, if you want to do the things that are worthwhile on this earth, on this earth if you want to enjoy your money or your education or whatever it may be, if you don't have health, if you, for example, want to see the face of your family, of your spouse, of your children, but you're afflicted with blindness, then that must really be difficult. That is a struggle in and of itself, right? To, to have something so beautiful as your family members and not being able to see, that's difficult. Or for example, to, you want to go and you know, go for a walk at the beach or you want to, go, you want to come to the masjid and pray in jamaah with everyone else, but you're not able to because you have joint problems and low back problems and health problems. That shows the need to put effort into your health. And to be honest, the reason why I speak about health is because if you really think about health, physical activity, fitness, realistically in its core is free. It's easy, it's accessible. When we were in lockdown, what were people promoting? When you're at home, exercise. Push-ups, chin-ups, star jumps, whatever it may be, do anything. Because if you strive, you know, you get involved in resistance training. Resistance, what does it remind you of? Struggling, where do you find struggle? Jihad, jihad of the nafs, jihad of the soul. If you focus on one thing, trying to be healthy and trying to engage in physical activity, you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna feel better, you're gonna look better. And you're going to be like, you know what? I feel good today because I actually feel energized because of my workout. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put a, a bit more effort into dressing a little bit better. Okay, you start to dress a little bit better. When you go out in public, people are going to see that, wow, he is, mashallah, a, a young Muslim, you know, trying to represent his faith and teachings. And he has, you know, good health, good hygiene. These are traits of the Prophet. Something as simple as fixing your health or, you know, managing your health can remind you of the Holy Prophet. And inshallah, that's the ultimate aim. If we can strive in this world to focus on our health and to work on ourselves, we're no longer going to see that Allah is punishing us. Rather, it's a case that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this free will and chance to improve on ourselves, focus on the struggle, on the jihad, on the resistance of the nafs. Inshallah, you can be a, be be a better human being and join our gatherings as young brothers, Muslims, you know, as people striving to become a better human being. Inshallah, on that note, we, I, I pray from the bottom of my heart that the jihad of the nas for each and every single one of us becomes easier with good health. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Jazakallah khair, brother Muhammad Qais. Always, as always, it's a really great pleasure having you. Um, I should have known you would quote Tao, of course. You know, that's always, always your thing, you know, with um, Chinese medicine and all. You know, cultivating the soul, that's so important. Digging through those layers and layers of materialism and, and delusion that constantly surround us. Inshallah ta'ala, we can teach ourselves to do that and find that that uh, great spiritual treasure that lies in each and every one of us. 
Of course, it takes effort, but inshallah ta'ala, we can do it. And what you mentioned with the managing the um, finances and drawing that parallel between struggling, struggling to manage finances and jihad, of course, really important because with finance, you have to provide the, um, the um, necessary minimum at the very least. You know, you, you need to have something for yourself. It's the same thing with jihad. It's not, as Brother Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Sadiq was also saying, it's not completely denying ourselves of the material. It's finding that right balance between the two. And Alhamdulillah, you highlight, highlighted that beautifully with that example. So, Jazakallah khair, um, as always. And with that, inshallah, we'll proceed to the next segment. I'd like to invite Brother Mustafa Bismi to deliver his presentation on the subject. Please welcome him with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. to be a part of this panel with beautiful speeches that um, we all heard just then. Um, I would like to build up on a lot of um, what Brother Muhammad Sadiq said. Um, he pointed out something really interesting about breaking down the subject of jihad and nafs and why is it a struggle in, a, in the first place, right? Like, so you have human beings created, like he said, at the highest pinnacle point of all of God's creation. Human beings are, out of all of God's creation, at the highest points. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi being the greatest of God's creation. Uh, and that is due to the intellect of man. Right? The intellect of man, in of its essence, is why human beings are the greatest of God's creation. If you take uh, the intellect of man out of the human body, we cease to really possess any real quality that... Um, can be differentiated from apes, right? Um, and one of the one of the famous hadith from Imam Amin Mu'minin is when he talks about how God has created man and animal, and the distinction being that man has been given intellect and desire, right? And and animals have only been given desire, and the third being the angels have been given only intellect, right? So they're not really influenced to make sin. Um, whereas we're smack bang in the middle, right? And we're, we're influenced. This is sort of where the duality of man, you know, all these philosophers over the years have pointed out how we're so inclined to fall into sin, uh, so inclined to be at our own, be our own enemy uh, due to our own bad decisions. And the crux of all that is falling, falling to your sin, falling victim to your lack of poor judgment, your void of rationality if you may um, and so I want to focus on that how to, how to combat that jihad of nafs like how do you how do you combat that struggle um, because it is a constant war between your intellect and your desire like Bra brother Muhammad had mentioned um, there are many desires it's not just um, the main most powerful desire uh, is lust as Imam Amir Muminin has said um, other desires for example, falling under greed, falling under power, falling under anger, right? Um, each and every one of these desires, if you were to ponder about it, if you were to ponder about the control it has on you, you'll see that you can counter these desires by using your rationality, right? And Imam Amin Mumini talks about this, how he says, counter your lust with forbearance. Counter your anger with silence, right? And when he talks about countering these desires, he's saying that, you know, confront it like it is a person. You know, challenge it, meaning ponder about how you think, right? Ponder about when you face, you know, a struggle in life. Sometimes struggles, each and every one of us has different struggles, right? Imam Amin Imam Amin Mu'minin says, don't judge your fellow brother because he sins differently to you. 
right? Each and every one of us has our own sin in, of our, in of ourselves, and the best of us are those who focus on our own sin instead of looking at others, right? Now, how do you combat this sin? How do you combat your own struggle? Challenge it with intellectualism, right? For example, a common one that I'd like to focus on is, is anger. Anger is something that um, Imam Amin Mu'mini talks about as it cripples your intellect. When you're angry, you can't think rationally, right? You ever been in a situation with your family and you, you, you know, you're having a bit of a fight and you're going back and forth? You may say something, and this has happened to a lot of couples, right? Um, married people, when they're angry, you'll say something in the heat of their anger, something that you'll end up regretting, right? And those words will stick to your partner forever, right? This is a, this is a saying by Imam Khomeini to his uh, son-in-law. He said, when you're at a point where you're extremely, you know, you're there's a bit of conflict, right? You should leave into the other room and rest and calm down before you go back into dialogue and engagement. Because at the heat of that anger, you will end up saying something you will regret. And it will only lead to further conflict. If you look at relationships, right? Here in Australia, let's look at non-Muslim relationships. A bit of easy, easy target. Let's, um, let's look at non-Muslim. If you look at most relationships, the reason why I'm saying non-Muslim is because divorce rates are a bit more transparent. But if you look at relationships here, most people get into relationships based on emotion. And most people leave relationships based on emotion. Right? The heat of a fight, and I'm getting my lawyer. Right? There's very poor rationality in that process. There's no like, okay, how do we work this through? How do we break down conflicts? How do we engage in dialogue? It's the heat of the high of, you know, a good time. And it's the low that causes the breakup. And this is very common, 50% of all marriages, nobody stops to think about what the hell's going on, right? It's worth a thought, right? So in terms of, in terms of struggling with anger, with family dialogues, I want you to ponder when you see two people having conflicts, and this is like, in our community, there's a conflict every other day, right? I want you to engage in, 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 in witnessing how, what is the crux of the issue at the conflict. I see conflicts happening all the time, whether it be in, in, in family relations, whether it be in community relations, and I study how people, why, what's causing the conflict. Sometimes what's causing the conflict is the, the ego. Sometimes people don't want to give in. You see this time and time again, a lot of fathers, they don't want to, um, they don't want to like, ever stand down and admit wrongness. It's typical in our communities. It's like, the, it's this patriarchal system that we've created that um, men, men don't want to admit wrong. They'll do anything but that, right? And so that creates some sort of toxic power dynamic. And again, this is part of jihad and nafs. It is a struggle of the soul in the sense that a lot of people, especially men in our community, we, we don't want to sometimes hand the torch down. And that's based on ego, and ego is based on jihad and nafs, right? It's a topic that's not talked about enough. And that in of itself is a conflict with your intellect, because your intellect will tell you, will dictate to you that um, it's not a rational way of behaving in society, right? To, it's sort of like some sort of tribalism. It's sort of like some sort of primal, uh, control dominance that we have created, whether it be in community, whether it be in a family setting. Um, this is anything that opposes your intellectualism and it's coming from an aspect of desire falls directly into the category of jihad and nafs, right? So when you experience this, when you see people having conflict, examine why they're having conflict. And most of the times I've seen it, it's like based on ego. Study that and then see how you, yourself, have made that mistake, right? And I want you to see how you, when you're engaging in an argument, when you're engaging in a conflict with someone, see how, if you are the bad person, right? I want you to reevaluate the situation from a third party perspective, where you're critical of yourself and how you behave and how you talk to people. Imam Amin Mu'minin told his companion, he said, it is more, I, I prefer it for you to 
evaluate the conditions of two people's conflict, this is a hadith of Imam Ali, than to give two dirhams in charity. He says, I prefer if you just ponder about two people fighting, you can observe for yourself, oh man, I've been in that situation, I was the bad guy in that situation last week. Then give two dollars in charity, not even think about it, right? This is Imam, two, two dirhams back then, talk about inflation, it's probably a lot of money, right? So think about that. The act of pondering um, is a very, very important thing when it comes to jihad al-nafs, the topic of jihad al-nafs. Because to counter your desire, you use intellect, right? You combat it. Like I said, it's like your enemy that you're fighting, but it's yourself, right? The self-struggle. You see, see your own desire how for, for, for some of us it's like, you know, laziness. For some of us it's rudeness. For some of us it is our ego. And it sort of like gets in the way of our life and prevents us from self-development and growth. That's why it is your enemy, all right? Imam Amin Hamidi talks about how your own ignorance is your own damn enemy because it makes you, it traps you in, in a state where it makes the wrong decisions for you. How many people in the United States, you have like, what do we have, like a million deaths from COVID? How many people lobbied? How many people walked out and protested against uh, health measures? The same health measures that would have prevented them from their own death, their ignorance got in the way, and they're dead. Like, that's the greatest enemy. That's a, probably the most easiest example of how your ignorance can be your own enemy, right? So counteract that with your own intellect. Um, and that's all I would like to say. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Brother, Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Alhamdulillah, I love how you put intellect as the crux of your entire discussion. You know, intellect it basically um, distinguishes mankind from the animals, and the desire, of course, as you mentioned, it distinguishes us from the angels, and that contrast is what makes mankind unique. Because we have the potential, as you mentioned, um, I think all of, our, all of the um, brothers his, here, I, I believe they've mentioned that mankind has the capability to be higher than angels at, and at the same time, less than beasts, less than animals. You know, alhamdulillah. And as you mentioned, if we just exercise a little bit of intellect in these situations, in these um, conflicts that we experience on a family level, on a community level, anything like that. If we exercise that little bit of intellect, we can end up avoiding great disaster. And the point you mentioned about that marriage, you know, some partner says one thing and it sticks with the other person forever. You know, that's so powerful. Something little, something tiny like that can cause a butterfly effect essentially. And it goes back to one of the sayings of Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. A moment of patience in the moment of anger can prevent a thousand moments of regret. Subhanallah. And last point of course, um, it brought to mind the example because you mentioned I believe Imam Khomeini. He was saying that in these situations try and take a break, cool down, collect your thoughts and then approach the situation something to that effect right yeah so it brought back the example of Amr bin Abdul during the battle of Khandaq you know Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam had him pinned he could have killed him and Amr spat on his face and then Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam he walked away he took his moment to cool down and his reasoning was that he would not kill someone for the sake of his own anger but only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so alhamdulillah, really engaging powerful examples. As always, an honor to be amongst these, uh, these, these um, exemplary panelists, great panelists. Allah bless you. Um, Inshallah ta'ala with that, I'll begin by segment and then we'll move on to open discussion. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina. حبيبنا وحبيب إله العالمين خاتم النبيين جد الحسن والحسين أبي القاسم محمد
وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله أنهم الرجس والطهرهم تطهيرا ولعنة الله على الأدائهم أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونفس وما سواها فألهمها فجورها وتقواها قد أفلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها صدق الله العلي العظيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful Once again السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Tonight of course Jihad al-Akbar, Jihad al-Nafs, and it's been explored in great detail by the three, um, three other speakers amongst me. Now, the verse I quoted in the Quran earlier, inshallah, we'll uh, get to that in one moment. But first of all, what is, a na- what is the Nafs? In the very basic and fundamental definition, when we take away our materiality, our bones, our flesh, our skin, everything that makes us apparent and perceivable, observable in this physical world. When we take all of that away, break it all down, we are left with the, with the soul. And the soul, it's something immaterial. And even after we die, it continues to last. Now, brothers and sisters, as Brother Muhammad Muhammad Qais mentioned, cultivating the soul is of the utmost importance. And of course, he linked back to the great Chinese philosopher Tao. Now, the verse I quoted in the Quran, Surah Al Shams, chapter 91, verses, verses 7 to 8, wa nafsin wa masa waha, and by the nafs, by the soul, and he who proportioned it, he who fashioned it, fa alhamaha fujuraha wa taqwaha. And he inspired it to distinguish between wrongdoing and righteousness. Fujuraha wa taqwaha. Now let's pause here for a moment and think, brothers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that there is something innate, something intrinsic within every human being that is able to distinguish between right and wrong. And this is a very bold statement, something very powerful. It shows that when we cultivate, as Brother Muhammad Qais mentioned, when we dig through those layers and layers of materiality, everything that blinds us in this world, we're able to see, we're able to bring to the surface that knowledge that is very clear within our souls to distinguish between right and wrong. And I'd like to mention two examples here, quite recent examples here, where you see this taking place before you in the real world. The first example is someone I'm pretty sure everyone knows. The former president of the United States, George W. Bush, the pioneer of the Iraq war, the Afghanistan war. My brother was showing me a video. In this video, George W. Bush recently, he's discussing the crisis between Russia and Ukraine. And look at what he says. He says that he described it as the brutal and unsolicited conflict, unwarranted attack upon, what does he say next? The brutal and unwarranted attack upon, not Ukraine, Iraq. It just slips out of his mouth, out of his mouth. It just slips out of his tongue. Like he can't help himself. And this shows that somewhere deep inside he knows, he knows. And against his will, inadvertently, it just slips up and comes to the surface. And this substantiates the claim of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The nafs knows, even if the human being denies. Now, if you go back to the Iraq war, of course, if you research this in detail, you find crime after crime after crime, day by day, taking place. The assassination of journalists, the slaughter of civilians, the killing of nonviolent protesters, the dropping of depleted uranium shells upon Fallujah, which caused the worst birth defects, the worst genetic defects in all of history. George Bush knows all of this, and perhaps the worst part, laying the foundation for the creation of ISIS, 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy them insha'Allah ta'ala or whatever is left of them. The second example, someone we might not know, an individual by the name of Nabil Qureshi. This man is a so-called Christian evangelist. The reason I called him so-called is because I don't consider people like this to be true Christians. I don't consider them to be true followers of Christ. I've met Christians that are genuine, whom I would consider brethren in faith. This is an individual who would spend his years demonizing Islam, attacking the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And he would twist and turn verses from the Quran and ahadith to portray a completely false narrative that someone with even the basic and most rudimentary understanding of Islam can debunk or refute with ease. He would do this knowingly because this was a man who was a former Ahmadiyya Muslim, you know, so they follow another prophet apparently, but he became a Christian. So he, he knew the Quran, he knew the Hadith, and yet he was deliberately doing this for all of these years, demonizing and slandering Islam, the Holy Prophet, Muslims, time and time again. And those who understand Islam and they hear some of the things he says, they see clearly how ridiculous it is. Now look what happens towards his final days because he passed on recently. Towards his final days, when he's in that moment of vulnerability, he's looking at the camera and you can see the terror upon his face. He's terrified. And you know what he says to his followers? He says, do not use what I say to attack Islam or Muslims. He's panicking here because somewhere deep inside the nafs, deep inside the soul, he knows. He knows what's coming next. Again, that substantiates the claim of the Holy Quran, a very bold claim, and yet one which manifests itself in real time when we pay attention, when we observe what's taking place around us. Alhamdulillah. The next part of the verse, فَأَلْحَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاءَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And blessed, is the one who purifies it and doomed is the one who corrupts it speaking about the soul of course blessed are the ones who purify the souls now of course purification of the soul it's been discussed in great detail by the the other brothers here so i wouldn't need to mention much on that but i would like to give an example in order to um, further accentuate these points so think about uh vast sum of gold buried beneath the earth, somewhere deep underneath. When we corrupt our soul, essentially, metaphorically speaking, we're adding more layers and layers of dirt over that treasure of gold, making it more difficult to extract. On the other hand, when we engage in a spiritual lifestyle, when we fulfill our wajibat and mustahabat, and when we're engaged, focused, we're not overcome with arrogance. This is a very important point because Shaytan himself, he did more ibadat than every one of us. He might have done more ibadat than every Muslim put together in this world. And yet he failed because he was trapped in a bubble of his own arrogance. And when he was told to bow before Nabi Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, that bubble burst and his real face, it showed. He was unveiled essentially. So we need to get rid of this arrogance, this hubris that so many of us have. And one point that Brother Muhammad Qais also mentioned that helps um, get rid of this arrogance is that interconnectedness between people, between all of us. When we connect with one another, we see the value in each other. It takes away that arrogance where, whereby we believe that we are somehow unique or special or above someone else. That's not the case. And um, as you saw, every one of the, of, the, of the panelists here, I observed, they had something unique to say. When we bring all of this together, front and center, we maximize the benefits that we can achieve as a community. And this is what we need. And that's a great part of Jihad al-Nafs. So Alhamdulillah. That's basically the main point I wanted to mention about Jihad al-Nafs. So, 
I believe everything else been, has been covered in quite a bit of detail. So Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah everyone. Inshallah we'll do the open discussion segment now. So the first point I wanted to raise, and this is an interesting one. When you think about the word jihad, there are some references to jihad that show that it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a good form of jihad, so to speak. Go back to Ziyarat Ashura. A hundred times we read, Allahumma al awwala zalim in zalama haqqa Muhammad wa alayh Muhammad wa akhirata bihinnahu ala zalik. Allahumma al anil isabat allati jahadat al Hussein. The part I want to focus on now. May the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon those who did jihad, those who struggled against Imam al Hussein. Our struggle, our jihad, it's not necessarily good. And it's very important for us to distinguish between the right kind of jihad and the wrong one. And the wrong one, of course, is represented by people like the Khawarij or ISIS, Daesh, all these guys. You know, look at Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. He was someone who constantly prayed. And yet, look at the action he committed. May the curse of Allah be upon him eternally. So that's an interesting thought about jihad. Uh, anyone have any further thoughts on that? Um, I like how you mentioned Ziyarat al-Shura because well, we as Shias and lovers of Ahlul Bayt, we always focus on Ashura being the most important day of our Islamic calendar. And in the Ziyarat, we actually say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma ja'al mahya ya mahya Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Wa mamati mamati Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Oh Allah, allow me to live the life of the Holy Prophet, Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and his family and also have the same death as the Holy Prophet and his family. So when we strive, we're actually praying for it. So this one way to help, to help us you know, identify what kind of jihad is good. Because when you look at the day of Ashura, there were many jihads. There was one jihad where, you know, Khur ibn Yazid Riyahi, he was like, oh, what should I do? Should I, should I stay with Yazid? Or should I join you know, the son of Zahra? You know, we all know the jihad of him and how what he experienced. And then secondly, you know, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was having a jihad about something which wasn't even haram, which was, should I drink the water? It, there's no crime in drinking the water, but he knew that his master, his brother, Imam Hussain was thirsty. He knew that Sukaina, Ruqayya, the children were thirsty. But he decided still not to drink. And now, alhamdulillah, his thirst is never, you know, you know, his thirst will always be quenched. You know, you'll never be thirsty again. So the point I guess I wanted to elaborate on yours is we actually have a formula to help us when it comes to okay, identifying which jihad we should be. Number one, looking at the day of Ashura, which side are you on? Number two, when you identify which side you're on, then you can pray for it. And if you want to be on the side of Hussein, you say, Oh Allah, allow me to live the life of Muhammad and his family, and inshallah we live the death of the Holy Prophet and his family. Subhanallah, that's exactly right. And when you think about the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family, you know, they always lived lives of contentment and satisfaction, regardless of what they face, regardless of their adversity. And it's a great lesson to all of us, especially in times when we're feeling down, depressed, in, in a, I don't know, spiritual or, or um, mm -hmm. moral low point in our lives. It's always good to refer back to the lives of the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, of course, they lived in a state of contentment and they died in a state of contentment, no matter what they faced. And that's what Jihad, jihad al Nafs brings that kind of contentment out of us. It brings it to the surface. You know, no matter what we face, we're always satisfied with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the great titles of Imam Ali al Rida alayhi salatu was salam, Ar Radi bil Qadri wal Qadha. The one who is always content in the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So inshallah ta'ala, all of us, as Brother Qais mentioned, we can live the lives of these blessed individuals and try and also follow their path towards death as well. Inshallah. And when our Imam returns, inshallah, we can all attain martyrdom in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not something we shy away from. 
this is a part of jihad as well. And the interesting thing is, um, this is another point that just came to mind. When we think about martyrdom, Western society often frowns upon us. Oh, these people, they want to die. They don't care about life, this and that. They're just violent, bloodthirsty, this and that. And yet when you look upon their film industries, they're constantly glorifying death time after time after time. Here is Achilles killing a hundred Greek, a hundred Trojan soldiers altogether. Here is this other great hero killing these many people here and there. And they're shown in such a heroic, charismatic, inspiring way. Yet when it comes to Muslims, you know, there's an inconsistency here, a great hypocrisy. You know, so inshallah, that's one of the ways we can look upon Western, seri Western stereotypes by spinning it back around on them, telling them, you know, you should clean up your own backyard. You're throwing stones from a glass house, basically. So, yeah, <laughs> that's my thoughts on that. Any, any thoughts from... Um, there was once a uh, scholar in, in Pakistan and um, he, he gave his talk, it was during Ashura, and um, he ended the talk and whatnot. And someone came up to him and said, um, you didn't curse anyone. It seems like the majlis was incomplete. How, how come you didn't curse anyone? And he, and he looked at him and, and he goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, it's, it's, it's the Qazi. You have to end with a cursing of some sort. <laughs> and it was, it was an interesting yeah, thought. And um, so, so, so the, the guy asked the sheikh, are you against Shimma? Are you against Umar ibn Sa'ad or not? He goes, no, no, I'm against them. Don't get me wrong. He goes, why didn't you curse him? He goes, look, I'm happy to curse him. But he goes, just point it in that direction. And, and so the bloke lifted up his hand and he pointed in that direction. And he goes, what do you see? And he goes, I see my finger. And he goes, all right, turn your hand over. And he turned his hand over. And he goes, now what do you see? He goes, I see three fingers. He goes, be careful when you point the finger because there's three pointing back at you. I'm not, Ziyadah uh, is a beautiful, beautiful Ziyadah, but there's a lesson from it. And that is that when we're, when, when, you know, we curse those who did their jihad against Imam Hussein, it's reminiscent of something that exists within ourselves that we have to be reminded. So I could, you know, I, I concur with the two brothers, what they've said. Um, within us is Shimon, within us is Umar ibn Saad, within us is Yazid, and we have to be aware of that. Now, Carl Jung, the, the psychologist, came up with this idea of the, the archetypical character, right? So you have a, a character, but that character represents something deeper, right? So for example, for Achilles, you mentioned Achilles. Achilles is the epitome of bravery and everyone can somehow resonate with this archetypical character. A good story has a good archetype. That's why the Quran is filled with archetypes. Every prophet is unique in his own way in that he's an archetype in a way. Um, Shimmer, Yazid, and Ibn Asad are also archetypes in our tradition. The question now arises, all right, we have to be careful of what jihad we are pursuing, which struggle we're pursuing. Um, and I'm going to politicize this a little bit, so <laughs> forgive me. But um, within, within our culture, we have also, within, within our communities, there's often a merge between culture and faith. And it, it's interesting because Islam, is, is <laughs> Islam has a very flexible and adaptive nature to it, that it can embed itself in certain cultures and the culture thrives because of it, and Islam thrives off that culture. But cultures are human constructs at the end of the day, and there are certain cultures that do perpetuate perhaps negative habits. So for example, um, you know, in, in traditionally in, in our communities, we have lots of rights for women in our home country, right? But when we come here, we try to hold on to aspects of our culture that perhaps aren't compatible with the Australian way of life. Not to say that the culture is lesser in any way, but what it means to what, what I mean to say here is that there are aspects of look back back home. There's a there's a whole country that facilitates a way of life. Australia has a different way of life. Now, for example, and and we are all aware of it, and it, it is it, it is something that does need to be spoken about. The way we, we treat our family members or the way we are raising our children, for example, needs to be re-examined. And there's a certain jihad of sometimes preserving culture, but at what expense? That's, that's my main point. So I'm not making a value judgment on anything here, but I'm saying we have to reconsider what is within us and what is within the jihad that we're pushing. We have to be self-critical 
of the agenda that we push. And so all I'm saying is allow us to reconsider what we're struggling for. That's a very interesting, um, a lot of interesting points that Muhammad Sadiq made. Um, when he mentioned how there's a lot of characters in the Quran and it is sort of like a good versus evil, I don't want to say anime, final <laughs> battle, but it's sort of projected like that because if you think about it, when the Holy Prophet talks about Imam Ali al-Mu'mineen, he says, Imam Ali is such that only the believers will love him and only the hypocrites will hate him, right? He's such a polarizing personality, such that it divides people into these different groups and they wage war on the Muslims based on the character and values the Muslims hold, right? Throughout the Quran, it's always been the polytheists talking about the prophets and saying, you know, you're telling us to leave our gods and we will never follow your ways and this, that. It was always that constant conflict between the two. And that's what creates, you know, this like perpetual war. Like you said, like Ibn Muljam and Imam Ali, we have the Khawarij and then you have the Shia, right? And both of them, by the way, think they're doing God's work. That's the crazy thing about it, right? They're both willing to give their life for the sake of God. Ibn Muljim attempted to kill Imam Ali, Qurbatan illallah. That's crazy. You've got to wrap your head around that, right? There's a lot of people who are not like that. Like um, someone like Muawiyah, this guy's like, yeah, let me try to get the most out of this Khilafat. And then there was a Khawarij that did it sincerely at the bottom of their heart. There are people who genuinely believe that killing Imam Ali, killing Shias, is part of uh, God's work, right? When people like, why would someone blow themselves up in Parachinar for, for financial gain? It doesn't make any sense. They're doing it for the betterment in the hereafter. They genuinely believe it. I mean, blowing yourself up, I mean, come on, let's be honest here. There's not much you can be compensated for in this world, right? It is genuinely like you believe in it, right? And you have both sides doing it. You have both sides going to war, giving their life for that cause, not for financial gain. That's why it's very important to, like you said, break down and understand your own beliefs before you're so ready to put your life on the line. Most, most people are like that. To, to radicalize communities, you sprinkle a little religion in there, you sprinkle a little justification for the hereafter, and all of a sudden, they'll give their life for it. Right? That's how in, in the United States they put patriotism. Patriotism is another big thing. In, in India, right? people with very nationalistic identities, they're willing to kill and lynch people in the streets for that identity. This is, this is me, this is my father, this is my grandfather, this is who we died for, this is what I have to uphold. This is the, the nature of, of humans. We like to fall into these creeds. We like to put these sort of identity tags on ourselves to, to justify our actions. In of itself, like talking about intellect, it's naughty. Like that's how, that's tribalism. This is like not how intelligent people behave, right? Imam Amin al when, when, when Brother Hussein was talking about how he didn't kill that man on the battlefield because he would have killed it out of his personal anger. He spat on him, right? He would have killed it out of his personal anger and not for the sake of Allah. Look how he differentiated that. Because if he did do it for his personal, he's no different than everyone else. Right? He's voiding his action from intellect. And that in itself is the sin. Do you see that? And so, when you want to examine these sort of like beliefs, you need to, you know, comprehend them. You need to delve deep into the crux of what they're based on. Um, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Jazakallah khair, brother Mustafa. It actually brought back to mind, um, and then was it was it you who mentioned, uh, or was it uh, brother Muhammad Sadiq fighting? Um, sorry, I, no, no. I believe it was you treating your inner self as an enemy on the outside, something like that, right? You mentioned. your own desire is your enemy it's like the enemy that you can see because you can't see inside yourself but it's much easier 
this kind of it helps when you think about it that way you know uh, alhamdulillah um, and like brother muhammad muhammad sadiq said each of us has that yazid shimmer inside of ourselves but when we deny it we could very well end up in the same course as the shaitan you know because he denied all of his flaws look what ended up happening you know never be in self-denial we have an evil inside of us all of us but we have to recognize that and overcome it with the goodness inshallah i wish we could go on much longer but the <laughs> it looks like the um female side has finished their program so inshallah we'll just have to conclude uh, conclude here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all for attending uh, this amazing program I found um, pretty sure all of you found it to be the same it's good to do something different like this inshallah I pray the audience members benefited greatly as well inshallah ta'ala we'll have something like this again in the future and it would be an honor to rejoin all three of you on, on this panel inshallah Allah bless you all and Allah bless everyone in attendance and everyone listening online wassalamu alaykum jameean wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin to conclude the program i'd like to invite brother muhammad qais to do ziyarat صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله